Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank everyone, if I can, for uh, praying for Dora and give you a little bit of, little bit of uh, update on what, what happened and how this all took place and how God was in all of it. Um, first of the month, Dora missed a lot, uh, and before that, she missed a lot of the worship service because she was coughing so much. We thought it was just a cough from some kind of an allergy or something. Turns out it was her heart. And uh, what was making it cough is the blood was regurgitating because of a bad valve back into her lung and she couldn't breathe very good and it was making her cough. So at the first of the month, we saw the heart doctor and um, he said that the valve would need to be replaced. So they did some tests, they did quite a few tests on Dora, and uh, I prayed that somehow God would heal her without surgery. But as we all know, God answers our prayer, but sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's wait. So, we had to uh, look into maybe having surgery. But then they found out that the problem with her heart was there was a lot of calcification. And they needed to fix the, the mitral valve and they had to take it out, put a new one in. They found out with the calcification that was gonna be too risky because you can't put sutures through stone and that calcification was like stone. So they couldn't take the, the old microvalve out and put a new one in and suture it to the heart without disturbing the calcification and that would be very risky. So they wanted us to try a different method. So on June 13th, Dora went into the hospital in Burlington to have what they call a, a mitral clip put on the valve where they go up through the growing and clip the mitral valve so to stop the regurgitation and not have to do the surgery that was so dangerous. They tried it twice. I was praying that the mitral valve would work because it's not so risky. And they tried it twice and it failed both times. So God said no. So now she's in the hospital. She stayed in the hospital from June 13th for 18 days. And the reason she was in the hospital so long is because they were searching for another way to do this. Because the surgeons told us with the, with the calcification, if they try to disturb the calcification, they could actually make a hole in Dora's heart if they did the traditional mitral valve replacement. And they said if they made a hole in her heart, it would be fatal and she'd die on the table. So we kind of wanted that to not be that way. We asked them, what if we don't do anything? They said, if you don't do anything, she'll probably have maybe a year or two to live, and the blood will eventually build up in her heart. Her heart will fail, and she'll, she'll die. So when they, they didn't want to do the traditional microvalve because it was so dangerous, they looked at Boston for, because of a new kind of a valve, one that they don't have to take the mitral valve out and just put this other valve in and push the other one away. And I was praying that that would work. They, they found out because of Dora's measurements, that valve won't work because it won't fit Dora's heart. And it's, ex it's an experimental valve, it's not FDA approved, and they only have two sizes. And Dora didn't qualify. So God said no. So, they checked with New York City and they did the same thing and it came back no it won't it won't work so the only thing offered to her was the traditional microvalve replacement which we already knew was dangerous if they made a hole in the heart it would be fatal if they didn't make a hole in the heart when she came off the bypass machine the lung heart machine and started the heart working again, it could fracture and it would be fatal. <coughs> so 
So we were scared. We did a lot of praying. Pastor Dan and Shelly came and prayed with Dora, which comforted her a lot. But there's one thing we knew, that through all of this, God is in control, no matter what happens. So they said the only thing we can do is we can schedule her for the traditional mitral valve replacement. And they were going to do it that Tuesday. They were going to do it on June 25th. So we prayed again. We didn't know what God's answer was going to be. But we knew that whatever happened, it was God's will. She'd either come home to me or she'd go to be with our Lord which she'd be better off than being here, but I wouldn't be. So I, we prayed hard, and we didn't have much, we didn't hold a lot of hope that it was going to be a successful operation. So when, when she went into the surgery, there was a peace about her and I. I can't even explain it. We weren't fearful. And when she went into the surgery, into the operating room, she smiled and waved. And I smiled and waved back. I went to the waiting room. She, she told me that when they put her on the operating table, and the anesthesiologist said, are you ready, Dora? She went like that, and he high-fived her. And then he put her to sleep. Five and a half hours later, God answered my prayer. He left her here with me. I'm so thankful that we have such a, such a powerful God. But it was in his time, not ours. It's, it's when, when he knows it's right, because it's for our good and for God's glory. And God was glorified through all of this because this is the one that was going to be the scariest and nobody thought it was actually going to be a successful surgery. But through prayer and supplication, as it says in, I think it's, uh, uh, I can't remember the book now. My mind is kind of getting that way. I, I, I tend to think I used to be sharp as a tack, but I'm afraid somebody hit the end of the tack and I just don't remember things that I used to remember. But I remember one thing. God is glorious and God is great and he's all powerful and he's sovereign. And if Dora, Dora would have gone and to be with him, that would have been his will. Dora would have been better off. But he left her here with me. And I want to thank all of you for praying because God answers prayer. Thank you very much. Amen. So turn with me. We're in Acts chapter 4, getting towards the end of chapter 4. Um, as you're turning there, what were the four things? I, I'll ask the kids again. Kids, what are the four things the early church was devoted? They said the early church was devoted to four things. We looked at that not too long ago. Can you tell me any of them? I don't care the order. Prayer. Yes. Prayer. Prayer. Breaking bread. Breaking bread. Fellowship. 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 Awesome. One more thing, and it's all, those guys are hogging all the answers, so I'm going to wait over here someplace. Do you guys have the other four things? Prayer. Uh, what'd you say? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't. Doctrine. There he's got it. The apostles' teaching, which is doctrine. Are these things important? Uh, very important. Don't you think, uh, is it, uh, in our century, is it any different that we should be not devoted to these things? Are you devoted in your prayer to, in your life to prayer? Are you devoted to these things? Man, this is, the church, early church was devoted and, and did they see God move? And so I think there's a, we ought to be involved, devoted to these things as well and to see what happens. Now, let me recap because if you uh, came in on this uh, late, we just say that uh, the apostles were Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, three in the afternoon, going to prayer, a prayer meeting. And uh, they saw that lame man who had been there even when Jesus walked the face of this earth. And 
had probably been there laying at the temple, even in Jesus' ministry, but was never healed. And on this day, as Peter and John were about to enter the temple, he, Peter looks at him and he gets his attention and he says, you know, Peter says, well, I don't have money, but I'll give you what I got. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Well, that man who'd never walked, <laughs> strength entered into his bones and he learned to walk like that. You believe in miracles? <laughs> this is what happened here. You couldn't deny it. You couldn't say it was a headache. Well, I never could see it. This, this, was, this was something everybody in Jerusalem knew about. He's walking, he's hanging on to the disciples. The disciples turn and say, don't look at us as though through our power, goodness, we've done this, man. We're people, we're sinners. But he says, look, and they turned the attention to Christ. And then he began to preach the gospel to them. And he was really not mincing words at all. He said, you're asking us, how did this happen? Let me tell you, the one you crucified, that Jesus of Nazareth that you killed, that Jesus that you killed, is the one who healed this man. And God's work continues, doesn't it? Show that Jesus is now ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father, but continues his work on earth. Isn't that encouraging? That Jesus, when he left, his ministry doesn't stop. He gave the commandment to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They're out there doing it. And God from heaven, Jesus is still healing people on earth through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's on the scene and aren't you glad he's here today? Aren't you glad he takes residence within you? That he lives, he isn't dead. And so the people repent. Many of them come to Christ, 3,000. Now, now in this last message after they were arrested too, right before their arrest, there's another 2,000 added. And uh, this is, in, in Bible times, you'll notice that as you read the Bible, it only counts the men. I don't know why they do that, but it only counts the men. And sometimes it says, you know, Jesus fed about 5,000 uh, not including the women and children. So often, here's probably at least fifteen to 20,000 people now growing. It just the men were about 5,000 this time. And they're now arrested for healing a man. Peter and John go to prison. Maybe the man went with them. I don't know. Just trying to settle this before uh, it was too late in the evening to do it. Sanhedrin gathers the next door. The Supreme Court of the nation gathers and tried to intimidate them, put them in the midst, really put fear into them, you know, and ask by whose power did you do this? And Peter stands up boldly and begins to proclaim the Jesus of Nazareth, the one you killed, the one they thought they'd washed their hands with. He's done, we're done with this Jesus of Nazareth. And yet his name is popping up again and again and again, and more things are happening and he keeps, up in most of these, a lot of these, the persecution came from the Sadducees who didn't believe in a resurrection. And so they're putting the pressure on, but Peter stands up boldly, says, you killed him. You killed him, but he offers you peace. He's the old, there's salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. And he's really given them a chance to repent and turn to Christ. But they're obstinate. Some receive, and you'll find that too. But as you preach the gospel, there'll be some who believe, but there's going to be also your opponents uh, who will, even despite the fact that there's a man who everybody knew, every Caiaphas who was there saw that man daily at the temple. He still, Annas too, Alexander, John, all those guys, they opposed even seeing a miracle. So miracles aren't going to convince people. Miracles are used to it. attest the word, uh, the message. They go together to confirm the word of God. And so uh, they were with one accord. What do they do now? They're a great number. The church. What should we do now? It says in the at verse, we pick it up at 23. I'm sorry. We're going to start at verse 23. And when they had, they were released, that is Peter and John were released from prison. And I happen to think that this man is with them, at least in the, the gathering now. They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So they said, you know, this is what happened, guys. What I just told you. What are we going to do? Now we could uh, go to the government here and uh, why don't we just pick it out front? Why don't we, um, we're pretty a number, let's appeal this, this, this ban that they've given us. Preach no more in the name of Jesus. That's the ban we've been given. Let's, let's go and, and stand before the Sanhedrin and see if we can't get a repeal. Is that what they did? No. What's the first thing they did in verse 24? 
And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God in one accord. They, they lifted up their voices to God in the midst of their difficulties and their trials. They knew, number one, that they'd been given a mission. Uh, they turned to God and, well, they began to say, let's just pray about this. Uh, can we call ourselves a church if we're not a house of prayer? <laughs> Good question. The other church was. Jesus even came to his, the temple there and said, uh, you made it something that I didn't make it. You made it a den of thieves. He said, but my house should be called a house of prayer. And so it's encouraging to hear Carol share these testimonies and answers to prayer. Because this is a God. And we gather every Wednesday night just for no other reason than to pray. Because <laughs> we need him. We need him. And the early church decided they needed to go. They'd been given a mission by, by Jesus. How many times before he left? He said, go into all the world. And then in, even in Acts chapter 1, you'll receive power after that the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where they're at. They're bearing witness and things are happening. But all of a sudden, everything seems to come to a screeching halt. The, the Supreme Court of the land is now telling them, you cannot preach in the name of Jesus. They warned them. They threatened them. They said, stop. And they said, well, we have to obey God. And they said, we need his power. We need help. We need help. There's opposition. What are we going to do? They lifted up their voices together to God. See, that's why I think it's corporate prayer is important too. If you've never come to a corporate prayer meeting, please do. You see it in the church. Here, I just pray at home, fellowship. But come and pray together. They prayed together. Let me just ask, what do you do when you face difficulties? Do you try everything else before you pray? I'm guilty of that sometimes, even in simple things. Remember when Daniel and, and, uh, was threatened in Babylon with losing his life and all the wise men were going to be wiped out because they couldn't tell the king his dream? What did Daniel do? He got his three friends to pray. Hey, let's go to prayer. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're done. <laughs> they went to prayer. And I, I can't extra, express the importance of prayer. They were, the early church was devoted to it. You find anything, time something's happening, they're praying. And they're praying here. And this is how their prayer started. In verse 24, part of the end of verse 24. How did they address God? Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. Despot is actually the word for it. <laughs> which is the absolute ruler, master. Another way to say it, as Carol said, he's in control. Now, I don't know if you find comfort for that. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, King Uzziah just dies. And in the year that King Uzziah dies, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His robe fills the temple, but he was sitting on a throne. Sitting on a throne. Who's on the throne today? This one's still on the throne. You're not going to dethrone Jesus. You're not going to dethrone God. And you'll see that in this passage as well. But he's somebody who's in control. Uh, the disciples, remember, they came to Jesus way before this, years before this, or at least a few years, and said, Lord, teach us to pray. They never, they never asked Jesus to teach him to preach. They never once went up to Jesus that we have on record, teach us to preach. But they did go up to him and have it on record that he said, Lord, teach us to pray. I think they observed him. They observed him this time of prayer. They saw him in prayer. And they said, Lord, you got to teach us how to pray. And you know how it goes, right? Our Father, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Right? That, that, that's often what we do, isn't it? I mean, here they're threatened with their life. Things are happening. Wouldn't they go right to, Jesus, you just heard what happened in there. We're going to lose our life if you don't enter it. They started out with, and this is will encourage you in prayer. Believe you, <laughs> believe me, it does. When somebody at prayer meeting sometimes begins to talk about God, somebody in this room, you know who it is when I say this. God, thank you, you're a faithful God. Remember, remind you of somebody who almost weekly thanks God for that he's a faithful God. And it, it, it does something to me as we, 
begin to pray and we realize who are we talking to? What? We're talking to God has never forsaken his people. A God who's never failed. And in these circumstances, they're looking at the most powerful men of the nation, giving them a ban not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And if they can't preach in Jesus' name, there's salvation in no other. And they say, what are we going to do? Let's pray. And they begin this way, Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. And I believe in that group of people, where probably thousands are gathered, hundreds if not, beginning to pray. Just what that did for them. They talk about how big the kings are and the decisions they're making. And all of a sudden you dress the ruler of the universe. Sovereign. God who's on your throne, in control, master. Sovereign, Lord. And it makes it a lot easier to go through things when you know this about God. We just went a while back through the attributes of God. And the reason I like to do it is because if we understand the God of the Bible, if we know who He is, when we go through trials, we understand His character and it helps us get through with the right attitude like Carol and, and Dora. They said from the beginning, it's in, even before the surgery, God is sovereign, it's in His control, and we have peace. See? You have a right view of God, then you can have peace in those times. And Job is a good example, huh? Loses his family, loses everything, and at the end, you know the story. He says, The Lord gives, and I think this was easy to say the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In this, Job didn't sin. Then he goes on, and God puts him on trial, kind of through the book. God was. Judging, testing Job, taking out the, the, the sediment that was still maybe in his heart too. And at the end of the book, and you guys, men, men know it, some of us who went through Job recently. God tells Job, Job to put on his men's pants. And I'm going to ask you some questions. Where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? Where were you when all this happened? God just begins to go like this to Job, and Job's with ah. Well, Lord, I, I knew you were great, but man, now I know you're even greater. This is just, I, I can't say a word. And when it's all said and done, Job 42 and 2, Job answers this way. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He comes to the end of life. God, I know who you are. You can do all things. And no one can stop you. And then he's asked to pray for his three friends. And God appears to one of them and says, listen, I'm not happy with you and your two friends there. For he says, I know, uh, or he says, uh, you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. You have the wrong view of me. And now I want you to go to Job and ask for forgiveness. He's going to pray for you. And you, God, God didn't just leave it this way. They were friends, remember. In the middle of the book, they were enemies. They were at each other's throats. And in the end, God reconciles them again. Isn't, this, isn't God good? See, if you're at odds with a brother or sister right now, God can reconcile that. It's just awesome. This is the God that we serve, but he's sovereign. God's will is that they preach the gospel. They know that. They say, well, wait. Well, let's wait till the heat settles down a little bit. Then we'll start preaching again. They just went right to prayer. And they thought about who he is and what, what he'd done. Remembering his words before, they, before Jesus ascended into heaven. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Is that true or not? All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, preach the gospel. I remember a man, missionary, who would, I think he was trying to get into, I don't remember what country it was. He didn't have a birth certificate. They weren't going to let him in the country. And he says, uh, I, I have to get in, he says. I've been commanded to get in. And when he told him, he took the scriptures out. And he showed them, he says, right here. They said, uh, he says, well, I don't have a birth certificate. You can see I was born, right? <laughs> I was born, so I, I'm here. You know, I don't have a birth certificate. He pointed to the scriptures, and I think this was under communism. But they, they pointed to the scripture where we were commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They let him through. <laughs> they let him through. All authority has been given to me. Sovereign Lord. Someone who no one can stand in the way. This is the one we get to talk to. This is the one we worship. This is the one uh, they, in this hour of need they come to. 
And then and they begin that way. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, you're sovereign. See, you don't have to pray those exact words. It's a model prayer for just pray after this manner. And as they're thinking of their heavenly Father, and, and they just say, wow, this is the sovereign one. This is the sovereign. Hallowed be that name. And then they say, your will be, your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's all, see how prayers begins with God? And that's how our prayer should begin too. With his, his business. Isn't it usually we pray about our business? Jesus, I'm kind of in a jam now. I know I haven't talked to you for 12 years, but if you help me this time, I promise I won't talk for another 12 years. No. This is the one we get to talk to. And as he's doing this, he says, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Wow. Does that encourage you? It does to me. In Psalm 121, I think this uh, verses 1 and 2 have been the most encouraging to me through the years in prayer meetings. It goes like this. If I, if I, I lift up my hill, ah, eyes to the hills, from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is where my help. Where does your help come from? Now, I remember times in our life, and I've shared testimonies as we were traveling in different parts, where we called out on God. I didn't know how he's going to do it. But he came through. And to remember that the God who made the heavens and the earth is the one who comes to my aid. Then I do something for you. Then I say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, oh, Lord God. Sometimes we'll end prayer meeting with this song. Ah, oh, Lord God, you've made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too difficult for thee. It's a great way to end a prayer meeting. <laughs> Leave it in God's hands. God, there it is. You made the heavens and the earth. Well, after making the heavens and the earth that Dan talked about here this morning as he led, what's my problem compared to that? That display of power. Jesus even said, what's easier to say? <laughs> your sins are forgiven you or to take up your bed and walk? Well, so you know that I have the power to forgive sins. Well, stand up and walk. The man got up and walked. Power. God's limitless in his power. And so here they call out to him again. See, that's why it's important to have a biblical view of God. That the God you're talking about, the God you know, is the God of the Bible. And as they're praying here, uh, I'm reminded of, I think it was Jehoshaphat. Who I, I, I can't remember who was coming against him in Syria. Or they were coming against him and he says, Lord... We can't stand against this horde that's coming against us. They're, they're too powerful. He admitted, here's our circumstance. Too powerful. And we don't know, and I don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Is that a good place? Powerless against what, what's coming against us. Not knowing what to do. You ask me sometimes that. Some people ask me, how is it pastoring? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> but we're powerless. Powerless. But our eyes are on you. And God came through. God came through. And so I think that ought to be an encouragement as we go. Verse 24. He's talking, remember, who he's, he's ta in the background is this. Sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Now he says this. Who? This one. This, this sovereign Lord. Who through the mouth of, your fa of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit... So what he's doing is calling, uh, quoting uh, verses from Psalm 2. Okay? I love this about it. Who wrote that? Uh, the sovereign Lord who, who through the Holy Spirit spoke through David, a man. Isn't all scripture God breathed, inspired by God and profitable for us today? Everything you read Old Testament and New is inspired by God. And there's so many times the author in the New Testament will simply say this. The Holy Spirit said and quote a verse. Aren't you glad he's behind everything that's written here? And this is why it's important for us to be devoted to this teaching, to this book, to know God. Bruce asked that question this morning. Why do you study the scriptures? The Pharisees studied it for one reason. They thought that in it they would have find life. Why do we study? It ought to be so that we can know Jesus better. Get to know this God. Have more intimate relationship with him. Okay, 
So he's going to quote this psalm through David that was spoken. They knew the word of God. And it's, it's okay to pray, pray scripture when you're praying. You know, especially when they're comparing something that's happened. Whoa, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit brought to their attention this psalm. They said, oh, remember Psalm 2. It goes like this. Why, uh, why did the Gentiles or the heathen rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers again, uh, gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, in Jerusalem, where they are right now, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Remember, that's Isaiah's way of looking. They knew who he was referring to, the Messiah, when he said, your holy servant Jesus. That's how Isaiah often, and so they knew that. They were accused of killing the prince of life. Earlier, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and people of Israel, they... This is who was involved. This reminded of them. Oh, the scripture. Why did the heathen rage? Why did the Gentiles rage? I mean, this is rage, right? We call something road rage today, right? You know what that is? It's not just angry. It's beyond that. It's the rage. I just dismissed some little kids from a wrestling practice at the gym years ago over in St. Albans. And just after that, there was a shooting out front at the stoplights and a lady was killed. It happened because of road rage. And then my friend who I wrestled with and stuff, he was a police officer. He had to go out there and hold him down and figure this out. And I was glad we dismissed the kids right before this happened, that they were out of there. But I thought, rage. And there's that same rage. Why do the heathen rage? People actually get upset. Have they ever done it to you? I haven't had it very often. But somebody who will just come in your face and rage because you're against abortion or something or killing babies. And just rage and their veins in here just turn colors right why do the heathen rage and listen to this and plot in vain is it i don't know what that does for you but i, I they're vain plots what do they think they can do little man against a sovereign god why do the heathen the, the gentiles rage and and then he says listen this in this city this happened you rulers that i'm talking about right now you killed him you put him to death you think you can stop them, but you're, you're, they're just vain plots against him. He names all the, the key figures in his crucifixion here. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. So don't get discouraged in our day. It's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? When you look at the world, listen to the news stuff. You can get discouraged. And you say, whoa, what hope is there for our children growing up in this generation? I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad, but I, I, I am saying we shouldn't be a people of fear. We should face it and say, we got the Holy Spirit on our side. We got God on our side. Yes, the heathen, the, the, the Gentiles are going to rage. But you know what? They, and they're going to plot. And they will do some things. But in the end, their plots are in vain. Their plots are in vain. Because he says in verse 28, look at this. What does the sovereign one do? The people of Israel, they did this, and the Gentiles and all these. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predetermined or predestined to take place. He's looking at the cross. He's seeing the rage that took place and those vain plots to put Jesus to death. Jesus went willing to the cross. They crucified him and God turns it for good. Oh, that's just what my hand, my hand planned to do. The same hand that made the heavens and the earth planned this out, that his son would die. And they're encouraged in their, our circumstances. Yes, they've, heated, they've made a plot against us not to preach again in the name of Jesus. What are we going to do? Oh, we're going to remember that there's a sovereign God in heaven who when these people make vain plots like this, he's going to take that vain plot and further his purposes with it. You've got to believe that in your circumstances too. Or you get discouraged. You will get discouraged. But remember who who's told us to go into the world and preach the gospel? Who left us the Holy Spirit until that work's done? To do whatever your hand and your plan. He'd already told them this same thing earlier in the chapter, didn't he? Though it's not quoted here, you know how the next verse in that psalm goes? 
God gets the last word. The Bible, the Bible says God shall laugh and hold him in derision. Somebody always said at the end of uh, uh, you know, you want to hear God, you want to tell, you want to hear God laugh, just tell him your plans. <laughs> tell him your plans. It won't go like you think, but in this sense too, but the, when the heathen are doing this, that God is sovereign. He sits in the heavens and laughs. You, you think you're in control. You, all the big shots of Jerusalem, you think you're really in control. I gave you the authority you have, but I'm ultimate. I'm an ultimate authority. You're misusing your authority. And you'll be judged for that. But I'm going to work out my plans and purposes. Isn't that encouraging? And they're encouraged in our situation. Okay, we saw it happen just a few weeks ago. Just a few weeks ago, Jesus died on the cross. And praise God he did. Nobody stopped it. And so I have salvation through the name of Jesus today. And my sins are forgiven. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And I'm going to walk with him right into eternity. And be the rest of my life. Spend the rest of my time in heaven just discovering how awesome he is. I think that's what's happening in heaven. That as the elders that are around the throne hear something new to them, maybe a new understanding, they fall before the throne and worship. And I think that's the way it's going to be too. Do you do that here sometimes? I'm just awed at God sometimes. I just fall to my knees. Usually tears of joy just for God showing me something about himself and just praising him for it. And this is what they're kind of doing here, just calling out on this one. Uh, verse 29 let's draw this to a close here John 29 and 30 and now the Lord and here's what they said okay they took care of everything to kind of get their hearts in the right place and now Lord look upon their threats what do you think he didn't see it he did but Jesus says ask tell me tell me what's going on in your life and so they said Lord look upon their threats and grant to your servants Grab to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. We need something, Lord. We need that boldness. They're asking for the same thing that got Peter in trouble. Right? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they said, these guys are uneducated men, common people. But they've been with Jesus. Oh, wow. Common men. Who been with Jesus. <laughs> Look upon their threats. And grant to your servants. We're asking for boldness. You think we need boldness in our day? I'll tell you when you go out into that world. They have different values than the Christian does. We. God has given us one man. One woman. Talks about a family. Be fruitful. Multiply. You go out there and. It's different rules, right? Different rules. Things that are accepted out there in the world. And you'll find opposition. You'll find opposition to the gospel. But God it says, even to the homosexuals in the church at Corinth, he said, such were some of you. But you've been washed. You've been cleansed. God is able to do that heart and to change. But I'm just saying here, they're saying, Lord, look at our threats. Didn't I, I won't have you look at it, but, well, no, I won't. All right. But remember, uh, uh, I want to say it was King Hezekiah. The Syrians are a threat. They're coming against him. They said, your gods are nothing. We've destroyed everybody. Before. We're going to come wipe you out. Hezekiah goes to Isaiah the prophet. He said, let's pray. Let's pray. He came. He takes that letter from Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. He takes and he opens it before the Lord. And he says, Lord, he spread it out before the Lord. And he said, Lord, look at their threats. What they're saying is true. We're, we're nothing against them. But those gods that they have are out there aren't really gods. You're the true God. Save us. Show yourself strong. Do you ever do that before the Lord? Maybe you got a nasty letter. I've done it. Spread out. Lord, look at this. <laughs> Help me with this. Help me to have the right reaction because I don't want to displease you and, or hurt and someone else. But lay your prayer. I'm like, Lord, look on their threats. They, look what they just said. And grant us boldness. And while you stretch out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is still alive. He's still healing. He's still doing these things. They said, Lord, grant these two things. Give us boldness to preach the word, not boldness for our own agenda. He says, boldness to preach the word. 
That's number one. And Lord, would you just stretch out your hand and heal? Do signs. Do these things. And in chapter 14, just turn it quick. Keep your finger there. I, I will be done in a second. 14 and verse 3. The signs are used and so on here. So, the, uh, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You see how it works? These things go hand in hand. Miracles and the preaching of the word. Um, speaking boldly for the Lord, uh, who bore them witness to the word of his grace. Just to encourage, yeah, this is of God. He did it. Never the other way around. That miracles becomes every. Some, you know people like that. are just out looking for miracles. Without, it doesn't matter what the word says. They just want to see wonders. And God does. God's alive. He hasn't changed. And so, Paul, they, Paul also asked for boldness. I'll just give you this reference. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. He asked the church. He said, the church at Ephesus, please pray for me. Pray for me. And what did he ask for? He's in jail when he's asking this. He says, and for me, that, word would be, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. What, the Apostle Paul needed boldness too? Yes, he did, and he asked the church to pray for it. Why did he ask the church to pray for it? You have not because you ask not. That would be a bad thing to, to have said about us. You never asked. This is ask me. And Paul, Peter knew how he needed boldness. John, the apostles, the, and Paul said he needed it. While God would stretch out his hands and do things. And the last, it would, the prayer answered, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Was their prayer answered? Was Carol's prayer answered? Our prayers? Yes. The place where they were gathered shaken. That was just a confirmation that God was behind us. He, he shook, Isaiah already referred to him, the threshold of the temple shook at the presence of God. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm going to answer that prayer. Here's a little earthquake to kind of encourage you. I heard you. I heard you. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no talk of tongues here in this time. God does it however he wants, doesn't it? But he fills them with the Holy Spirit. And I, I keep saying just to, I know, the reason we need to be filled again and we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit is because we're just leaky vessels. <laughs> Through sin and difference in God, we get sidetracked. God, fill me again. Use me. Let it be your power working through my life. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. Their prayer was out hindered. That's how the book ends. The book ends with that very, look at the last verse of the Bible. And it talks about Paul still being in prison. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. Okay? And that's how the book ends. <laughs> and that's where you and I come in today. We need boldness, don't we? Field days are coming up. We'll stand at the booth and, and share the gospel with people. We had VBS, Franklin County, uh, uh, the, uh, what's that called, the youth camp coming up here in a week or two, FCA. Pray for that camp. That God would use this in every opportunity. But look, this week, if you share the gospel with someone, look for, look for an opportunity. God will open one. I prayed. I always pray for these guys I do jujitsu with and wrestling. God opened a door. Uh, uh, Loudon's not here today, but uh, he had to do some filming for somebody. But uh, I prayed, and he's been coming. But I just think of two guys, even this past week, just to show you how this works sometimes. Normally, it's after practice is over, somebody will come up to me and we'll start talking about God or ask a question or I'll talk to them. But whatever it is, this time in the middle of the, I was wrestling one guy. And he said, listen, I, I just went to a Catholic wedding this week. And he said, they said a bunch of prayers. I didn't understand. I haven't memorized any prayers. Well, and that came up. And I said, oh, well, let's talk about prayer for a little bit here. You know, in the breaks. And I know. But anyway, so it just happened. And another guy said something else to me. He said, my father was a preacher. And he started telling me all his story. I was a Southern Baptist preacher. And his brother's a preacher. And this and that. I never knew about this guy. I didn't know he was walking. You know, 
He knows the Bible, but I don't think he's walking with God. But he's starting to talk and open up. So we just look for opportunities this week. And if you face opposition, don't. Come back to this sovereign Lord who made heavens and the earth and tell him, Lord, I need this boldness. I need this boldness that you talked about. The Apostle Paul, you gave it to him. You gave Peter and John boldness. You gave the early church boldness. You think God's going to withhold it from you? Uh, what do you think happened when they were, when uh, Carol uh, and Dora, Dora was going into the operation room and she smiles and waves and had that peace? Where do you think that came from? It's not natural. It's God-given peace. So in the circumstances, in our, our times like that, God will strengthen you. And so let's, I just thought that would be encouraging here to pray uh, for boldness. I don't know what your current mean. Maybe it's not to do with this, but if you have something today, some current situation that you, I just want you to ask God for. It. God, I need this in my life. I need boldness even. Let's pray for that too. But if you have other things in your current circumstance, I don't know anything about. Maybe your lack of peace. Maybe you have fear. Ask God. God, help me not to be afraid. Give me this boldness. And so let's pray, and then I'll, I'll read a benediction verse here. Father in heaven, we need you. We pray that you would fill us as we go out, Lord, to the week at work and, and things, and have opportunities to share about Jesus, and maybe we're commanded not to. But Lord, I thank you that you have all authority on heaven and, in heaven and earth, and we're to go and to preach in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. It was the gospel that we heard that has the power also to, to transform our lives. And so we thank you, Lord, for it. We ask that you would give success to your word. We pray that it would spread throughout Vermont. Lord, oh, you know how badly Vermont and, and uh, Canada here need you, Lord, need your word. So we pray, empower us. Give us that boldness to go out and uh, fearlessly stand up for you and do your will, Lord. And I thank you that, Lord, you answered this prayer for them, and you'll answer it for us. And whatever else may be our current circumstances that we need, wisdom, whatever it be, God, we know that you will answer. And I thank you in Jesus' name for your word that encourages us. And so, sovereign Lord, we thank you that you're still on the throne and that our circumstances are not out of sight. Maybe you're just waiting for us to say, look, look at what's happening. Lord, we need you and how often you come. And we help us to be patient as we wait for your answer. As Carol said, maybe no, 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 but now's the right time. And so we pray that, Lord, and thank you, though we orchestrated Dan's talk today, Bruce's lesson in Sunday school, Carol's talk. God, you are sovereign. And we thank you that we have such a one to be our God, our Lord. And we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. First Chronicles 29, 11 says this, and I hope this is an encouragement to you as a benediction as well. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heavens and in the earth are yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted above all. Amen. Amen. God bless you all as you go through this week. Trust him. Trust him. And pray and talk to him. God bless you. Thank you.